All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Courage and presence of mind mean the same thing, for presence of mind implies command of mind. Cowardice and a lack of mental control also mean about the same thing, for cowardice is rooted in hurry, the habit of hurry or a lack of repose. All degrees of success are based on courage mental or physical. All degrees of failure are based on timidity. You can cultivate courage and increase it at every minute and hour of the day. You can have the satisfaction of knowing that in everything you do, you have accomplished two things, namely the doing of the thing itself and by the manner of its doing adding eternally to yourself another atom of the quality of courage. You can do this by the cultivation of deliberation, deliberation of speech, of walk, of writing, of eating, deliberation in everything. There is always a bit of fear when there is a bit of hurry. When you hurry to the airport, you are in fear that you may be left behind, and with that comes fear of other possibilities resulting from that. When you hurry to work, or a meeting, or an appointment, you are in fear of some negative consequence of not being on time. This nervous habit of thought can grow to such an extent as to pervade a person's mind at all times and places and bring on a fear of loss of some kind, when there is absolutely no loss to be sustained. For instance, a person may hurry to catch a bus, and act and feel as if a great loss would occur if they do not get on that particular bus, when there may be another one close behind, or at most ten minutes waiting will bring it. Yet the fear of waiting those ten minutes grows to a mountain in size, and is in that person's mind a most disagreeable possibility. Through mere habit, a similar condition of hurry may characterize that person's walking, eating, writing, in short everything they do, and will render it more and more difficult for such a person to act with coolness and deliberation. Hundreds of the little acts of everyday life, such as picking up dropped articles from the floor, opening and shutting drawers, laying or reaching for things on the coffee table, and attending to minor details of dress, are done unconsciously in this hurried condition of mind especially when some more important object engages our attention. We snatch, we clutch, we drive recklessly about in the doing of these things, and we weaken our bodies and become tired out, and finally panicky and easily frightened through this mental habit, for fear and cowardice slip in far more easily when the body is weak. This habit cannot be changed in a day or a year, when it has pervaded a lifetime. Neither can the ills, mental and physical, resulting from such a habit, be cured immediately. There can be only gradual growth away from them. The quality of mind or emotion underlying all this hurried mental condition, and consequently hurried action, is fear. Fear is but another name for a lack of power to control our minds, or in other words, to control the kind of thoughts we think about. It is in this kind of unconscious mental training, which is very common, that begets a permanent condition of mind, more and more susceptible to large and small panics, at the least interruption or trivial disappointment. It makes for disappointments when none are necessary. 
It is the ever-opening wedge, letting in more and more the thought current of fear. For if you cultivate fear of one thing, you are cultivating and increasing your susceptibility for fear in all things. For example, if you allow yourself to sit in fear for half an hour, that the Uber car may not pick you up in time to get the train, you are much more liable to be seized with a series of little panics at every trivial occurrence or obstacle occurring on that particular journey. It is in this way that the nervous habit of mind enters into and is cultivated in the doing of so-called little things. If you pick up a sock or tie a shoestring in a hurry, you do so not only because such an act is irksome to you, but because you fear it may deprive you momentarily of some bit of pleasure. There you have again opened your mind to the thought current of fear, fear of losing something. The cultivation of courage commences in the cultivation of deliberation in so-called little acts such as these. Deliberation and courage are as closely allied as fear and hurry. If we do not learn to govern our force properly in the doing of the smallest act, we shall find such control far less easy in the doing of all acts. If we analyze what we fear, we shall find we are trying to deal with too much at once of the same thing that is feared. There is only a relatively small amount to be dealt with now. In any transaction, in the doing of anything, there is but one step to be taken at a time. We need to place what force is necessary, and no more, on that one step. When that is taken, we then can take the next. The more we train our minds to concentrate on the one step, the more do we increase our capacity for sending our force all in one given direction at once. Such force extends, and should be so used, in the so-called minutest details of everyday life. In this way, deliberation and deliberate action become habitual and we are in a sense unconscious of making ourselves more deliberate. Just as after long training in the opposite and wrong direction, we are unconscious of putting on the hurried frame of mind. We have to deal with but one thing at a time, and when we place our thought or force on the thing we are doing now, pleasure is the inevitable result. When you dress, eat, walk, or do anything with your mind placed on something else, you are making the present act irksome. You are training your mind to make every act irksome and disagreeable. You are making the thing feared a certainty. To bring us all what we want, namely happiness, we need to have perfect control of our mind and thought at all times and places. And one of the most important and necessary means for gaining this lies in this discipline regarding the so-called little or trivial things. If you hurry and slur over these so-called petty details, you are the easier thrown off your guard or confused at unexpected occurrences. And in life, it is the unexpected that is always happening. We need to keep always our mind present with us. We want it always on the spot, ready to use in any direction. When you tie a shoestring and think a mile away from that shoestring, when you sharpen a pencil and dwell on one of tomorrow's cares, it makes it all the more hard to concentrate your forces when the situation demands it. Our thoughts can move from one thing to another with more than electric speed, 
And if you unconsciously train this quickness to be ever darting from one thing to another, it will become almost impossible to keep it on one thing for 10 consecutive seconds. However, through cultivation of repose and deliberation in all things, we can train ourselves to fasten our thought on anything as long as we please, to throw ourselves into any mood of mind we please, and to throw ourselves at will into sleep or a dreamy state as restful as sleep. Deliberation of movement, or in plainer English, the movement of muscles so slow that our mind has time to follow it, gives one time to think in great and small emergencies. But a lack of such training causes unconscious physical action. The body moves without us being aware of it. Awkwardness, timidity, lack of tactfulness are all due to this lack of command of mind caused by a lack of deliberation. Or in other words, a trained incapacity for taking time to think or plan the proper thing to do. The terror-stricken person on a ship that seems in sudden danger runs up and down the deck to no purpose, and this physical action is in exact correspondence to their lifelong condition of mind, where thoughts have been ever darting from one thing to another with each and every emotion or whim. The more deliberate person, whose mind is trained to take time to think and hold or concentrate its thought, holds themselves steady, and so gives themselves time to see what may be the opportunities for escape. To train then for courage is to train for deliberate movement in all things. For that is simply training to gather and hold your force in reserve and let out no more than is needed for the moment. A person becomes cool and collected in the face of any great danger when they have the power of holding their mind to the thing to be done that instant. Cowardice has no such power and can see not only the source of danger but a score of possible results, which may or may not happen to them. In the so-called trivial act of picking up a sock, or threading a needle, or opening a door, I do not argue that all one's force or thought should be placed on the act, but only enough to perform the act well, while the rest is kept in reserve. It is the same as in picking up a weight. You would not try to expend the force in lifting one pound that you would in lifting fifty pounds, but you do expend a great deal more force in the act of picking up a sock when your mind is preoccupied with something else. For you are then trying to do two things, or lift two weights at once. Remember that anything which is done in your mind expends quite as much force as if done with your body. In expending just enough force to perform any act, you cultivate and increase continually that desirable state of mind which in everyday language is known as having your wits about you. That means, in other words, always having no matter what you are doing, your mental eyes open in every direction. And while outwardly you seem all occupied in the one act, your mind, like a vigilant sentinel, is continually on the lookout, so as to give you notice, in an instant, of all that is going on about you, and also to direct you how to meet the event, whatever it may be.